All right, just uh, another silly little design feature I've got here. That's uh, that's the Z homing system. So uh, you can see I thought of this after the fact and had to bolt this stupid little piece of aluminum on here. Uh, it's things like this that really turned me off of this project. Uh, not turn me off of doing it, but turn me off of like fixing and using it. It's like, I think one of the things I really have to work with in terms of design is coming up with a completed design before I run into machining it. And uh, that's what I've said I'm going to do with this new one, much to a lot of people's chagrin. Um, certainly, I mean, I don't know why I wouldn't have thought to include a better homing system in this one, but as it happens, I didn't. So I'm hoping to even get as deep as like oil passages and things. I want to make sure everything is nice and planned out before I cut a whole bunch of metal. Um, I think that would be a big recurring theme in this build has been like getting the core of it done and then like tacking on crap afterwards. I'm in a little bit of a pickle here because these two guys are stripped. So um, maybe doing a bit of left hand drilling to get those out. But for now, at least, I think what we can do, rotate this guy around. So this is the uh, Z drive assembly. Um, you can see it's also belt driven. This is another space saving maneuver on my part, I'm afraid. Uh, just the idea that having the motor stick out the back would have added sort of one motor length of length to this whole thing. So I decided to do it with pulleys. Um, which for the reasons I covered previously, isn't always the best idea. Just a 5GT belt drive. Now, I'm a little disappointed with how loud this turned out to be. I think I'm gonna do direct drive on this axis as well for the next build uh, and, you know, length be damned. Uh, let's see here. This is a uh, minuscule set screw that Probably, I'm going to strip out immediately. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Looks like I had a brilliant idea with a <laughs> larger set screw. Good thinking there, Greg. Evidently, I did it, so I wasn't too concerned with the risk at the time, but the obvious risk there would be burrs chewing your belt up. Yeah, that's definitely it. Stupid. Yeah, well, it came off. It's, yeah, so it's all corroded in there. So I wonder if something uh, reacted and seized up. Interesting. All right, so that's the end of the ball screw. So this is actually one of those cheap sort of ball screws, uh, the quintessential Chinese ones. I got mine from fidgets.com. It's a Canadian-based electronics supplier that also carries a lot of the sort of lower end motion components I'm looking for. I'm probably just gonna use another one of these for the next build, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it seems fine. It's not bent or anything. You can do something called screw mapping in CNC where you basically say, um, as long as you have a precise way of measuring it, you can tell it to say move one inch and if it moves 1.01, you can tell it remember, okay, now when you move an inch, you've actually moved 1.01 inches and it'll do that next time. It'll, in that case, move 0.99 inches kind of thing. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but screw mapping. Okay, pop these out. This is gonna be a, a bit of a beast to get out, I think. Um, the ball screw, at least. Uh, I just have memories of it being difficult to remove. Um, so I've got the ball screw actually sort of jammed into a slot in here, so, or the, yeah, see, so I popped it out, but um, yeah, it was in a nice slot. Okay. This whole process would be a lot easier if those two screws weren't stripped out. <laughs> just, just so you know. Um. Oh, <laughs> I just had an idea. This will make it easier. We'll just take these rails off. Yeah, so now this whole rail and carriage is going to come off. I'm going to have to find a way to break these off later. 
Maybe I can spot weld something to them with my fancy new spot welder. So a lot of larger linear guys will have cages across the balls, so you can actually take the rail out and the balls won't all fly everywhere. That's kind of a nice feature to have, especially when you're prone to doing that like I am. I want to see if I can pop this off. By which I mean I know I can pop this off. I want to see if I can find the right Allen key though. There we go. So you can see the other limit switch was kind of just crudely bolted under here and that's what was hitting that aluminum thing and it looks like it hit it pretty hard at one point. So um, let's avoid doing that in the future and use better limit switches. And like think about where we're going to put them first. Uh, the scribed information in here has to do with the preload. Uh, I think they measure each one out of the factory, that's why it's scribed on. Uh, one thing you'll notice about these IKO bearings that is different for the Highwind rails, or at least the 15 millimeter ones, these only have two rows, so you're functionally halving the capacity. These are actually a lot more precise rails, not because they're two row, but because um, they're actually a higher precision grade than the Highwind rails I got. But that's really getting to sort of the micron level of pitch roll and yaw error, so I'm not too worried. Back to this bad boy. Um, the, uh, the standard sort of um, Chinese made ball screw will come with um, a double row angular contact pair, which is sort of the larger base. It'll also come with a smaller base that has a single deep groove ball bearing in it. So rather than use that, I actually have the bearing directly in the frame here. Uh, I think that was good. I think that worked out pretty well. I'm probably gonna do that again. It's really nice to be able to use their preloaded pair of bearings just because it sort of cuts down on the amount of work that you have to do with uh, designing a housing and stuff. So I may stick with this, we'll see. Now this is tricky to get out just because of uh, how the alignment is, but I'll try my best. Taking apart your own stuff on camera is kind of funny because you don't really have anyone to blame for anything but yourself. So, yeah, there's, um, I think it's just because this is a close bore and the alignment on this is pretty close. It, it's kind of tough to get it out, but I got it out. So, so ball screws, you can't unscrew from the screw without losing all the balls. So I'm not going to do that. This is just a, a custom block that I made. You can actually buy these with the sort of ball screw kit for a lot cheaper. Um, Slightly different dimensions, but I certainly am probably going to do that in the future. I don't think I knew about that at the time, so, you know, ready, fire, aim, go make one. So anyways, Z-axis ball screw, 16 millimeter. It's got a, I think it's a five millimeter lead on it. So one rotation, five millimeters of motion. And uh, yeah, like I said, I don't have any huge problems with it. It seems pretty straight, pretty accurate. Like the surface finish is nice. So I'm probably going to keep using something like this. All right, let's get to uh, some of the sillier design stuff. You can tell I was certainly reasonably comfortable with the mechanical aspect, but whew, this electrical stuff, it'll get you. Uh, oh, I'm off my lazy Susan. All right, rat's nest. Uh, this is the wiring that I elected to do. Uh, the original plan was to have all the electronics inside. I've since determined that that is an unreasonable thing, especially in such a small machine. Um, I was going to put the Maso inside and everything, but yeah, I mean, the Maso is much larger than could be accommodated in here. The original plan was to have a smooth stepper and that would have fit in here, but eh, barely. The other problem is these motors need uh, 75 volts. So the power supply is actually quite large and there's no chance of ever getting the power supply in here. So yeah, keeping it as a self-contained unit was a little dubious to begin with. Um, this drag chain. So that looks pretty cool, right? I'm not convinced that it's what's needed. So if you're not familiar, a drag chain, basically you put your cables through it and it ensures that your cables are bent in differing places, not all in the same place, which prevents the uh, Apple headphone phenomenon of, of the one place bending back and forth so much the continuity gets broken. Uh, like I said though, not sure it's totally needed. Like it gets me what, I don't know, <laughs> you know, six inches of travel maybe. Like it's, 
yeah, it's probably just uh, overkill for this. Or, not overkill, but it's kind of the wrong tool. Um, made this little sheet metal guard. This is why I decided I hated sheet metal. So, yeah, this was originally supposed to come along here, but this motor was a hair too big, so that died pretty quickly. Uh, let's take this off. These are M2 countersunk Phillips head screws, which means I had to go after the fact, drill some M2 tapped holes on my nice steel frame, which the best thing to do would have been to do it when I was making it. Um, the second best thing to do would have been to probably not jeopardize the whole frame by drilling tiny little holes in it. So that tray just comes off there. These all have um, two fasteners at the end that hold them in place. Uh, I think that's probably all I'm going to cover with the cable carrier. Now the wires for the spindle motor are actually back underneath the bed and that's they're pretty annoying to get to. Um, yeah, so uh, they're, um, they've got tabs on the top so they can't pull directly out but yeah it's hard to move the tabs back there. Alright, so that is the rat's nest out. So looking at it now, it actually doesn't look that bad. Um, Z-axis motor, like I said, it uses a pulley um, to save some space. Um, like I also said, I'm not going to do that again. It's probably not worth the accuracy errors that I'm opening myself up to. Um, between you and me and the wall on my left here, I think I'm going to try to I'm going to try to work the Z-axis motor underneath the spindle somehow. I think that's probably a better way of doing it. Sorry, I'm reaching past you. I'm trying to find Allen keys. I think that basically sums up my channel. It's just me trying to find Allen keys in different situations. Hey guys, editing Greg here. I just want to go on record and say I think I had a pretty sweet idea for Allen key organization, and I think it'll be a pretty good video slash project but I'm going to write it down and get to it later. All right, back to the video. <sighs> All right, so, yep, there's the other clear path motor. Like I've said countless times, I love clear path motors. They're absolutely amazing, so I'm going to keep using these. May upgrade to a larger size. Not sure. Um, all right, so... I think I'm going to take a second and clear myself some space. Okay. Got a bit more space now, so let's take off this other linear guide. So this is actually kind of interesting, I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can see all the scuffing happens in the first like, kind of three inches of the guide, which is a pretty good indicator that I don't need this length of guide to do the kind of work I'm doing. And like I said before, uh, if I don't have a tailstock, I can't do anything longer anyways, so Hoping to have a tailstock on the new lathe. If not, you can expect to see a shorter lathe. I've got this U-shaped piece of sheet metal in the bottom here, and that the idea there was it uh, was going to deflect the chips down into a chip tray, which was going to be like a toaster oven tray. Um, it didn't really pan out because I realized how much I hate sheet metal. I don't think I'm going to hate sheet metal forever. My uh, my work just got a new press break, so. I'm sure I'll be acquainting myself with that at some point. Alright, got all the fasteners out. Now this just pops up from the bottom. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. What's going on? Alright, now we're getting really desperate. Wow, that was looser than it should have been. Okay. All right. Crappy bent piece of sheet metal with, the, well, yeah, a couple fasteners in it, maybe. Um, no huge problems with this. The only thing was I had to put some uh, adhesive back foam on the back because it, it used to have like a ring to it. 
and I was actually, I was finding that sort of natural frequency would oscillate quite a bit. So, yeah. All right, so you can basically see the main frame, which is black. I, I used, uh, actually I have a bottle of it somewhere. Where is it? Yeah, I use some of this stuff. It's um, Birchwood Casey Super Blue. They use it for bluing guns, I guess, but it, it's like a black oxide maker stuff. Uh, I don't know. The resting has mostly been around screw holes, which uh, I would have to assume the uh, Super Blue didn't get in, so I have to be more careful with that. But overall, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the stuff. Um, best case, it made a really nice uh, black surface. Worst case, it would come out kind of um, patchy like this. But yeah, this is a structural component. I just didn't want it to rust away. Incidentally, it's made out of hot rolled steel. So um, yeah, certainly prone to rust. Um, hot rolled just because it was... Uh, Pretty cheap and also functionally stress relieved because it's hot rolled, not cold rolled. Uh, that's my understanding of it. Not great for vibrations though. So we'll get into vibrations when I explain why I'm doing my, my next build out of epoxy granite. But basically the steel has a very low loss ratio. So for a given vibration in, it lets a lot of that vibration out more or less. Whereas something like epoxy granite uh, through internal friction will dampen a lot of that out. So. We'll get into that on a special video, I think. But for now, at least, let's get into the headstock and some of the more hilarious mechanical design decisions I made. All right. Um, first thing, this all would have gotten a guard eventually. I know it looks like crap, but yeah, I mean, it, it would have had a cover going around here. Sheet metal, you know. Um, so the most recent addition was this encoder disc. I just laser cut that. And if I bring you in close, that's being read by an optical interrupt. Um, never got the optical interrupt working. If I didn't know any better, I'd say I fried the diode in it. But again, I got to a point where I'm sort of not willing to like put any more money into replacing parts because I'm making a new one anyways. So at least that's how it would have worked. Um, it's actually the same way mouse scroll wheels work. The idea behind an interrupt is that um, it's kind of like having a threading dial on a lathe, on a manual lathe. When this rotates around, it breaks a beam going from one side of this to the other. And so you see the little gaps, it'll make a little blip signal every time it goes to one of those gaps. When it's threading, provided I tell it how many gaps there are, it'll wait for that same number of gaps to go around before it starts a threading cycle. And that's basically how it synchronizes threading with spindle rotation. It's, um, it's actually super low tech. Like you would think they'd need like a, a proper encoder on these, but really just a single slot disc is enough for threading. And I think they say an eight to 12 slot disc is enough for rigid tapping. So this is a 12 slot disc. Um, never got into getting it working with Masso, just, you know, too busy. Although I think they do support this. All right, I've lowered you a bit so we can look more straight on at the drive mechanism. So obviously this is a drive pulley coming out of kind of a transmission housing sort of thing. And that's just, you know, J section pulley is my new favorite. Uh, I've got a tensioner here and it's actually uh, a pivoting tensioner so I can set different tensions. All in all, I was a little discouraged by how much force is required to properly tension these. I don't think it would be good for motor bearings. Uh, I'm actually surprised no one makes like a, a pulley grade motor where it has better bearings in the front. You look at the sort of motor specs and they'll, they'll usually give you a maximum radial load and normally it's in sort of the neighborhood of like 50 newtons which is about five kilograms or 10 pounds i think so that's not that impressive actually i could easily see pulley tension being more than that all right so if i loosen this and also this yeah so see this just pivots like that um i'm gonna take this right off this was kind of a funny thing to do in CAD because it was done after the fact, so it got its own subassembly, which is, I mean, I guess it's a subassembly, but it's a pretty minor one. I think I'm going to hold on to this for future pulley tensioning shenanigans, although now that I'm rotating this, this seems pretty tight. I'm starting to wonder if these ABEC 11 brand bearings aren't actually ABEC 11. I'm just kidding. Um, I think these bearings are hooped. Yep. Yeah. yeah, these are not rotating very well. Good to know. Um, so now we don't have any pulley tension. I guess I better take this disc off first or else I'm just gonna break it. 
There's a good chance I'm going to break it anyways by taking it off, but we'll see how it goes. These are more of these little M2 Phillips heads. Alrighty. Now this can come out. God, I'm looking forward to not have to worry about dealing with these for a while. I think for my next build, I'm going to try to have something a little bit more elegant. I might have a hall sensor or something on the actual motor, sh or sorry, a magnet on the actual motor shaft or some kind of balancing hole or something, and then have a hull sensor read that, and that'll be my index. But until then, let's just not worry about these. The ones I'm used to using basically have four wires, which uh, one of them is, or two of them are ground, one of them is plus for the diode, and the other one is the return signal. And uh, these ones all have five wires and something about totem poles, I don't know. Okay, so now we can just run this belt right off because it's not tensioned anymore. Uh, pulleys look a little dented, probably from installation, if I know me. Okay, let's get into, uh, yeah, some of the sillier stuff. So you can see I had sort of the fundamental problem of getting the motor shaft down here connected to the, uh, the drive pulley up here. So what I had originally done is actually geared up the pulley. So I really want to hit 10,000 RPM on one of these. Kind of a silly personal goal. Um, what I found out is that when you gear a pulley, when you gear a system up, you lose a ton of torque at low speeds. It's all right to have sort of low torque at high speeds because, you know, there's inertia, it's high speed. Uh, cuts are sort of lighter per revolution. But at low speed especially, I wasn't able to cut anything. So I quickly switched back to a, a one-to-one -one gearing with two stages. The two stages are just to get... Uh, the power from down here to up here. The new build's going to have a two-speed gearbox, I hope. So what I'm hoping to be able to do is have a low gear and a high gear and be able to switch depending on um, what kind of cutting I want to do. And I want to try to be able to do that from the software. So I'm going to make a similar um, programming protocol, I guess, like I did for my tool turrets, but for my gearbox. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I had to dig out my old textbook on gear calculations. But because this is about the same size as like a, an Atlas lathe, um, same horsepower size, I mean, you could probably get away with Atlas gearing. But let's do it the right way for a YouTube video. I'm gonna take out all these M5s. So I'm calling this the sort of belt housing cover, I guess. Um, as you can probably see, it's made out of a solid piece of aluminum, whereas the headstock itself isn't. There we go. So, yeah, pretty straightforward piece. Um, overkill for a pulley housing, but um, kind of ties it together. What I want to get into here is it's not something I've sort of encountered before academically uh, in terms of design methodology. But it's something I've come to sort of not like, and I think it looks stupid, and I think it is stupid. And I'm calling it kind of like Lego brick construction. So a lot of the stuff I do, obviously, I use my workshop so I don't have, like, you know, unlimited budget or anything. I can't go out and order huge pieces of material. Although you kind of see why lathe manufacturers do that. But I basically use the material I can find, and a lot of the times that's, like, teeny little pieces that I kind of, like, bolted together here and there and I sort of built it up like Lego blocks that is really inviting not only sort of difficulty taking things apart like we're finding out now but also every time you have to join two parts you're sort of inviting misalignment so yeah it's certainly not a good way of designing and that I think is one of the big calls of epoxy granite is that you can get sort of large castings even in the home shop um, and that I think should save me a lot of this like improvised yeah like lego blocking kind of thing hope all that made sense this is probably going to be another case of me press fitting a bunch of crap together i guess this is kind of a lesson to not press fit a bunch of crap together Wow, 
Wow, that worked well. Okay, another large disadvantage is that to change the belt on this guy, you've actually got to take it apart and be able to hoop the belt over and then hoop it over the motor, and it's just, you know, belt change, bit of a nightmare. Um, nothing too special here about the bearing layout. Just got two deep groove ball bearings, and yeah, this shaft connecting the two pulleys. Um, so this Lego brick can come out now. I think this may also be bolted from the bottom, I'm ashamed to say. That's another thing. I like mostly having fasteners go in from one direction. Uh, you know, sometimes two directions if it's like a box or something, but when you got fasteners coming in from like five different directions, it kind of makes it, I guess, inelegant, but also uh, difficult to take things apart. So, yeah, so you can see anyways um, where I'm going with uh, the structure here. It's uh, the frame has sort of a, a thick section here and I got two half inch plates built, bolted on either side. And from there, all the crap gets stacked on top. Um, pulley, it's, or sorry, the uh, spindle itself can come off now. The spindle is a uh, reasonably standard way of mounting a spindle is just, uh, it's in like a split uh, housing and uh, just bolted onto the top here. There, so, spindle. Um, this spindle, actually, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, bearings still feel good. Uh, the bearings limit it to about 7,000 RPM because they're tapered roller bearings. Probably closer to 5 to be conservative, but, yeah, I mean, probably better get in there and re-grease it soon. I've got an entire video just on the spindle, so if you want to go check that out, it's, again, it's an older video, so it's not... The best video I've ever made, I'm sure, but uh, yeah, pretty happy with this. I may use it as a sub spindle or something, actually. Okay, um, so I don't think I'm going to take it apart too far past here. You can see um, basically the black section is the steel frame. I've got, well, you know what, I better take it apart further. <laughs> Almost got away with that. Okay, let's take the uh, spindle motor out. Here is spindle motor, also a clear path motor. At the time, this is one of the more powerful motors they ever made. They've since expanded into um, full horsepower size motors. Like, uh, I think they do 56 and up frame, 56 frame, 134 frame. Um, they look pretty sweet. Uh, it's really tempting to use one of those, but they're also huge. So uh, I don't know, we'll see. That spindle motor is about, uh, I think one horsepower peak, so. Respectable. Certainly for the size, respectable. The other option, I guess, would be um, like an AC servo in NEMA 34 size. But uh, we're starting to get into some pretty serious power, and it might be asking an awful lot of my wall outlets if I can do that. Um, so this is uh, another fairly silly part of this design is after a certain point, I was like, why is there no bottom on this machine? So I just bolted it onto a plate. I don't like the idea of having it on a plate because that would give crap space to accumulate. So I think, yeah, like a solid casting with drainage would be a lot better. And I'm sure that's why they do that. Oh, this is going to be tough to get these out. <laughs> well, we're really getting through it now. Uh, got the base off the bottom. My camera keeps cutting out, but I think it's because it can only record 20 minutes at a time and it takes me a long time to unscrew things. Okay, so now these plates can come off. So I don't, I don't think this design is hopeless. Like I don't think, certainly having the motor mounted back here does lend itself to having some kind of a gearbox or at least um, some kind of a way of, of adding a bit of extra support for the shaft to put up with the, uh, the pulley tension. But certainly didn't work well for me, I don't think. A two stage one to one pulley system is, should probably be a warning flag. Uh, like I said, gearbox, I'm hoping to have it automatically shifting. I think that's what most uh, real machines do. They'll have a, a, a gearbox that lets them... It lets the same motor that also that does 100 RPM also do 10,000 RPM. 
because uh, as far as I know, without sort of extreme power input like uh, uh, three phase power and stuff, I don't think any there's any motor out there that I know of that can do that. Um, to get a little bit off on a tangent, the more voltage you have available to you, the faster your motor can go because you can get over the impedance uh, of the motor coils. So motor coils are basically coils of wire and they have what's called impedance, which is uh, sort of a capacity to produce magnetic fields. And um, basically making them create magnetic fields, which makes the motor rotate um, requires voltage. And if you don't have enough voltage, you can't make the magnetic field develop all the way. So your speed is basically limited. So that's extremely true with uh, brushless motors, of which stepper motors are, for example, technically. I uh, hope that I got that right. If not, I'm sure I will hear about it. Not that that's a bad thing. I like hearing about it when I get things incorrect. Well, that guy's not coming off. Sorry, fellas. Now these uh, end plates are actually held on as well as with those screws. There's some dowels. Once I pull this off, you'll be able to see. There. So I'm gonna zoom you in. See those dowels down there? So that those were actually originally put in as machining references. So everything I did, I could do with fixtures based on these dowel positions. So I could actually get the locating edges, which are these edges up here, super per perpendicular, and also all the same. So you can imagine I could put the two sort of head pieces together and also the tail piece and uh, line them up with those dowels and machine them all together. And then the dowels actually are cross drilled like Ikea furniture pegs. So I could drill in and that's actually what holds these arms in position. So those are super repeatable and fairly accurate. So I, I actually really like that system. Um, I did something similar with the jeweler's lathe, just the uh, the two dowels, but I really like this sort of Ikea furniture peg way of locating stuff. I'm probably gonna do it again in the future. Anyways, I think that's as far as I'm going to take this apart. Now that I've gotten through the furniture pegs, <sighs> And I might charge my battery and go to dinner and then come back for the wrap-up session. All right, so I think that sums it up for um, this machine. That was the complete teardown. Hopefully you learned some things about what I did and what I shouldn't have done. I think in hindsight, um, things I really enjoyed and uh, I thought were probably worthwhile was doing my own spindle. That didn't actually turn out to be quite as intimidating as I thought it would be. Um, I used a, just a straight shank ER32 collet extension that, uh, yeah, worked out great. Um, threading the hardened material was tough, but, um, yeah, past that, certainly not impossible. Um, the steel frame worked out well, although I kind of appreciate now why machine makers will sort of cast machines out of larger pieces of material. Casting, of course, being cheaper, and also there's sort of a lot of real estate you've got to cover. So making it out of solid block, even if this size is, is uh, kind of impractical anyways. Um, yeah, I think uh, for this next build, I'm going to try to focus on what I want to get out of it rather than what I want it to look like at the end. I uh, certainly want to keep it small for this machine, but like I said at the beginning, like having linear guideways that long and no tailstock is totally useless. Like you'll never be able to turn apart that slender. Also, having a lathe without any kind of uh, coolant is a pretty big disadvantage considering aluminum is a fairly common thing to turn, especially at this level. Uh, so yeah, some kind of coolant would be great. The two tool turret thing was kind of cool, but I may switch it back to a, a single like 8 position or 12 position turret and just have drills built in on that. I was thinking about having something like a steady rest or a following rest, but that might be difficult. Better coolant drainage and chip evacuation would be important. I know a lot of CNC lathes will have a uh, conveyor belt. I don't know if I'm going to go that far. I very well might, but at least for now I want to sort of design with that in mind. And then wire management is another huge thing I learned from this. Like, you can't just trust that you can route the wires wherever you want. 
Uh, there's always going to be things in the way. There's always going to be things to drill extra holes through. And I think it would just be better to plan from the beginning where that's going to happen. So yeah, like I said, um, I'm going to start working on the new one soon, but I'm going to try to design a lot more of it before I start machining. Uh, that being said, I did 3D print the carriage cross slide design for now. This is liable to change, but yeah, you can see I've got sort of the 12 millimeter guides on there. Um, it's sort of hard to see, but I managed to uh, make some space for a, a 3 8 inch ball screw. 12 millimeter ball screw on the bottom. Um, the whole thing is designed to be able to be turned mostly out of a 3 inch piece of round, so I'm going to try to make it out of like 8620 or something. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen I've been playing around with um, sort of accordion way covers, like uh, sheet metal ones that the bigger machines will use. And that actually doesn't seem as hard as it looks, so yeah, I was thinking of actually doing a video on that today, but of course I forgot something at work, so I couldn't. Um, yeah, so I think the best way to keep, keep up with this project in particular is on Instagram, because I'll be posting there sort of day to day normally. I'm hoping to get big chunks of the design done so I can start machining relatively soon, but again, um, yeah, I don't want to rush into it like I did last time. One thing I also want to try is I want to try designing by functional group and then making a base around that. I'm a little ashamed to say I kind of started designing the base on this lathe before I knew what, say, the cross slide was going to look like, and that really limited me in cross slide height, which is part of the reason I couldn't use a ball screw. So. Yeah, I've basically got a spindle design I'm relatively happy with. I've got some oil passage routing to do and some wiring to do, but other than that, I think it'll be okay. And uh, the cross slide design is coming along. Not quite finished. I've still got uh, limit switches to put in. Um, and yeah, like oiling, wiring, that kind of stuff. But I think from there, I'll be able to assemble everything in 3D space, and then I can make a base that fits everything rather than making everything fit the base. It seems obvious now that I say it out loud, but certainly wasn't obvious when I first started so yeah anyways I hope you guys enjoyed that um, to my Canadian viewers happy Thanksgiving um, if anyone has any questions on this lathe or my plans for the future lathe let me know in the comments I'd be happy to answer any questions I didn't address in this and uh, yeah hopefully I'll be back soon with uh, a sliding wake cover video cheers <laughs>